Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Friday, February 8th, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to answer some questions uh, from the readers in the mailbag. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Soretta. And joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writer Swatran Bowie. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. TGIF. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, th- there's no news going on today, which is why we're having this mailbag episode. Uh, we're going to finally catch up on some old emails. Some of these are from, like, November. <laughs> so we, we're, we're, what I'm saying is I'm really bad at this, guys. So... Uh, questions about Thanksgiving. What should I eat with the turkey? <laughs> I actually had to delete some questions from our, our bag that were kind of like, you know, what movie should I see by the end of the year? <laughs> like, oh, we have failed our listeners in a big way. Okay. Uh, the other day we talked about on the podcast that no one seems to want to direct uh, James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Uh, and one of our listeners, Brian Thomas, wrote in with a suggestion. He said, uh, couldn't Peyton Reed do it? Just team him up with the Guardians of the Galaxy 2 art team and crew and get the world right and hand him James Gunn's script. Uh, I thought Ant-Man and the Wasp was every bit as good as Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. He clearly gets how to make a sci-fi action comedy with an ensemble cast. You just have to convince him to do it, I guess. So... I guess that's probably the the question here. Like, would Peyton Reed want to do this? Like, most directors of any name value, I feel like, don't want to take on a movie that James Gunn, like, you know, James Gunn created the series, and he's kind of, you know, gotten removed from it. No one wants to take on his 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 franchise, but Peyton Reed has done that. Do you know what I mean? Like, Edgar Wright made Ant Man, and Peyton Reed was brought on, given a big chance to jump up to the major leagues. And uh, d- direct Ant Man, but would he do that again? Like this, th- this is a guy that like he's worked alongside with at you know Marvel on the Disney lot. Uh, what do you guys think? I think the big difference here is that with the Ant Man situation, Edgar Wright w- willingly left that project, and Marvel had it open and said, "Hey, we need a director for this," and Peyton Reed was hired. Whereas this is very much a much messier situation where if James Gunn had his way, he'd still be making it. And it's just um, – it's a lot less of a work-for-hire thing and more of a uh, work for filling a giant gap that can't quite be filled thing. And I like Peyton Reed as a director. I think he's made some very good movies. Uh, I think he's I, – I think that he more so than like Taiko Titi be willing to do this. But I don't think – I don't think he's – I don't think anyone in the Marvel family is going to want to have – is going to step up and do this, honestly. And, he, and he's a big member of that family at this point. I'm wondering what you guys think about a Peyton Reed Guardians of the Galaxy film. Would that be any good? Mm. <laughs> Brad, I know you're a big <laughs> fan of this franchise. Yeah, I really um, I love Guardians of the Galaxy, and I like Ant Man. Um, and I just I'm not I'm not sure he has the right style. There's there's a little bit more of a I don't know I guess an edginess to Guardians of the Galaxy that I don't see Peyton Reed has in Ant-Man, even though he's he's obviously very good at combining action and comedy. Um, so it's not something that I'm really interested in, but at the same time, you know, I, I just still have a bad taste in my mouth for, from James Gunn not doing it, so it's, it's hard for me to imagine anybody tackling it. Yeah, I feel like I like Peyton Reed, um, but uh, I feel like it would be very anticlimactic for the the conclusion of the series to be directed by him. Um, and like, he's probably de- developing Ant-Man and the Wasp, you know, another sequel for, for that franchise. So maybe he doesn't even have time to step in and do this. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, who ends up taking on this challenge and uh, we'll cover it when it happens here. Uh, but let's move on to another email. Uh, this one from Koji from Tokyo, Japan. We have listeners in Tokyo, Japan, which is crazy. Uh, he writes in uh, that he's a big fan of the podcast. He wants to know what app do you use for tracking movies and TV series you have seen? Uh, I can speak for myself. I use this app called Letterboxd. And if you search that in the app store, that is Letterboxd without an E before the D. So it's a Letterboxd, uh, like, uh, yeah, 
I think that pretty much explains it. And this is an app that basically just covers movies, and you can track when you see a movie, when you repeat see a movie, you, you can review a movie, you can rate a movie, you can create top 10 lists. Like uh, when I was appearing on the Slash Filmcast for the 10th anniversary episode, I was able to go back and uh, rate movies for every year for the last 10 years and then take that data and actually you know make a uh, you know t top list for the last 10 years. So there's a lot you can do in the Letterbox app and there's also a website and a, you know web app for that. But uh how, HT, what do you do? I also use Letterbox, but I often forget to update it because my first instinct is just to write down um like log my movies in my bullet journal, which is not an app, but Again, I like just to write things down, and um, I end up using that sometimes to help update my letterbox. But yeah, letterbox I think is probably the best app for this because it has just a huge catalog of like all the movies and everything, and you can put like write little reviews or and entries when you um, and on the day that you um, you log them. So it's it's a it's a great app. It sometimes glitches, but otherwise it's, yeah. it works really well. And it's helpful at the end of the year for people like us that write about movies where we kind of forget what we saw in January. And you can go back and see all the movies you've seen through the course of the year and arrange it by your rating. And I'm not saying that ends up being the, you know, the ranking that we do in our top 10 list, but it's a starting point, right? Like a, it's an easy starting point. Chris, what do you use? Uh, I also use Letterboxd. It's great, especially for me because I see a lot of stuff and sometimes I lose track of stuff. Like I'll go back and be like, what have I watched in the last like two weeks? And I'll, I'll have like no memory of some of the things I've watched, which tells you either that I have a bad memory or I'm watching really forgettable things. But beyond that, um, this isn't really a logging app, but there's an app called Just Watch and it's a website too. And I use this for um, the streaming columns I write for SlashFilm.com. This basically will tell you everything that's streaming and where it's streaming. Netflix, Hulu, HBO Go, uh, Stars, any any streaming app you can think of, Shutter. It's all on there, and you can like um, you know set up parameters. Like I basically have it set up so every day I go on and I check it, and it shows me what's new streaming on every single uh not every single but all the uh the streaming services i tend to write about and this helps me you know find stuff because a lot of a lot of streaming services they don't have really great interfaces like uh i've said this before but amazon amazon prime has great movies but their their interface is awful and it's hard to find out what's on there so uh just watch is a really big help for stuff like that and it should also be mentioned that Letterboxd uh, has a great feature for a watch list. Like whenever I hear a movie I want to see, I'll add it to my watch list. Like uh, there was a movie that Ben mentioned, I think, on the water cooler this week, the uh, train robbery. The Great, great Train, train yeah. Robbery, yeah. Mm -hmm. I added that to my watch list. And then you can go in and look at all the movies on your watch list and you can actually – filter by like a service so like you could filter like which ones one of the which movies in this list are available on netflix which movies cool. list uh th the only thing i wish they would do is there was no way to add multiple services there so i i wish i could you know say that i have netflix i have hulu i have amazon prime now show me all the movies that are on all the services i have mm -hmm. but uh you have to go individually but it's kind of cool ben what what do you use what kind of apps I just use uh, my notes app in my phone and I, I created a note that is just called uh, 2019 Media Journal. And I write down everything that I watch, whether it's a, a TV episode or a movie or a book that I'm reading as well. Um, so anytime I finish something, I write that down. And if it's something that I've seen before, I put a little star next to it. But most of the stuff is is new. And then like occasionally for a movie that I know that I'm going to talk about on the water cooler or something, maybe I'll jot down a couple little little like bullet point thoughts about it to mention on the show. Um, but yeah, that that's what I've been using. I've done that. I started doing it uh, in the beginning of 2018 um, and really enjoyed that, like just having that that sort of diary. Um, and I'm sure like you guys were saying, you know, Letterboxd and some of these other things things would would basically do the same thing for me. But because I'm I'm trying to keep track of movies and TV and books, I just feel like a note at you yeah. know, my my own personal note is easier to um, 
to sort of keep track of that way. Yeah, I, I haven't found a really good TV app. I know there is one that a lot of people use. I try to use it, and it's not what I want it to be. Does anybody here have a good TV app for keeping track of TV shows? I'm assuming not. And that's no, a no. I think Letterbox probably doubles as that sometimes. Even they don't have everything. Um, yeah, they they don't have a lot of TV. That's the only thing I don't like about them. They they and sometimes people will add TV and they'll, they'll immediately delete it because I guess they only care about movies, which is a little frustrating. Yeah, mm. movies or if they're stand up comedy specials for some reason. <laughs> Jacob, what 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 apps do you use? I use the human brain. <laughs> I don't keep any <laughs> lists whatsoever. Probably my detriment. Uh, but I, every time I sit down to make a letterbox account, I have an anxiety attack and go, "Oh my god, I'm not going to be able to get everything I've, I've seen. I'm not going to be able to keep up with this. I don't want to. I don't want to maintain this." And I, and I log out. So no, nothing for me. It's so easy. You just got to type in the movie and just just hit the rating. It's it, it's then simple. people. Then people judge it. They look at everything you've seen and judge it. And I, <laughs> yeah, and that's I, another reason that I use the Note app. It's just because I'm the only one who sees it. And I don't want people knowing what I'm watching all the time. Oh, you, I watch you, a you, lot you, of crap, Peter. I watch so much crap. Um, <laughs> that I I watch more crap than I do good things because I don't want to, Sometimes I just don't want to do the work. And if I logged it all, people would look at it and they'd shame me on a daily basis. So no thank you. <laughs> Jacob, you can keep it private. You don't have to put the – it doesn't all have to be a social media kind of thing. Uh, Here, I'm, a, I'm a millennial. I have to have it public. It's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Brad, what kind of apps do you use? Um, I use Letterbox though, not as frequently as I should. I, I probably update it every few months or something like that. Um, but one thing that I do for myself is every year for the past few years, um, I've created a Google Doc, um, kind of like Ben, where I create I keep track of uh, the movies that I've watched. And I used to keep track of the one of whether it was a new movie or an old movie, if it was a repeat watch. Um, but I got just kind of tired of that because there's so many times where I just have something on the background and I forget to jot it down. And it's re it really wasn't something that I needed to keep track of. So now uh, I really only um, create a Google Doc with a list of the new movies that I've seen, whether it's in theaters or at home, and I, I number it and I put wh what date that I, I saw it on. And then some, uh, something that I have but I haven't updated in a little while is I have a uh, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet <laughs> that, that I, I actually inherited like the, the format for it from a friend of mine, uh, actually a, a former college roommate of mine, uh, who was also a big cinephile, and he started keeping track every year of the movies that he had seen, and he even like created like formulas to keep track of certain stats as far as like how many Academy Award uh, or Best Picture nominees he had seen and stuff like that. And so I I have the spreadsheet, and so I have one sheet for each year, and it has the list of all the movies, and it keeps track of the the number overall. Um, and you know, just shows how many I've seen each year. But I, I haven't updated that in a while. But that's one of like the nerdier ways that I keep track of of which movies that I've seen. That seems like entirely too much work to me. It's not. It's not too bad because, especially because I didn't have to make the spreadsheet. I'm I'm basically yeah. just putting information in what already existed. So it's it's not too bad. Um, but it's uh, it is something that I haven't updated in a while. So it, it obviously it was something that was a little too much for me to keep up with. Yeah, another cool thing about Letterbox, not to be an evangel uh, evangelist for Letterbox, but um, evangelista. Yeah, evangelista. <laughs> um, but <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the uh, you can put it so that like movies you've seen are grayed out, so then you can go to like other people's lists. So like people create lists of like here's all the movies that are nominated for Academy Awards this year, and you can see that list, and you could you know very quickly within a few seconds see which movies on that list you have not seen um so y you can basically look at other people's lists and see you know how much how much of percentage wise and which movies you haven't seen which is kind of cool i know back in the day i used to rate on imdb they for tv you can like rate by the episode so, like you say, I saw this first episode of Narcos Mexico, and I'll rate it an 8 out of 10 or something like that. But I don't think there's any good way of filtering that, so I, I'm not using that. So if anybody has, like, a really good TV app to keep track of TV, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing. Uh, one of my friends who doesn't go to the movies a lot, his name is Brian, he likes to keep track of the trailers he sees at the movies. 
So he'll write in a note document after he sees the movie what trailers he saw alongside the movie. Is anybody insane enough here to keep track of that? No. 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 <laughs> yeah. Didn't think so. Um, okay. I, I think it probably helps uh, Koji from Japan, uh, from Tokyo. Uh, and by the way, we should say, if you want to write a letter into the mailbox, you can write in to peter at slashfilm.com and please include your name and general geographic location in case we mention the email on the air. Um, let's move on to our next email. This is from Greg M. from Australia. This is truly an international listener show here. Uh, and he, he says that Australia is not known for having... Uh, timely access to all the TV and movies that are out there. And even with the addition of streaming services, it's still an uphill battle. Now I'm talking about finding obscure. I'm not talking about finding obscure or dated titles. I'm talking about finishing my watch list for 2018. I live in Brisbane, a city of over a million people, but in this, a, a town this size, our cinemas don't show anything remotely obscure. Melbourne and Sydney aren't much better uh, in 2018, I watched around 45 movies from the year. I was floored to hear that Chris watched over 300. By the way, he's already beat you for uh, he's already beat your 2018 uh, watch record in 2019, and so we're only a month in, so that's kind of insane. Uh, so his question is, uh, how do I watch more movies in 2019? So I think like Chris, how does he how does he do it? God, I don't know. I mean, if he's that limited by the area, it's almost I would never want to encourage someone to uh, steal movies. So I don't know, like, how else he could go about it, honestly, unless he, like, moves, (laughs) which seems like extreme. Like, yeah, you pack up and move to somewhere that plays better movies. I I really don't know that, you know, that limiting thing, it's a pain in the ass. And, you know, I can sort of sympathize because. You know, I live in the Philadelphia region, and even we get stuff sometimes very late. Especially, it seems extra late to me because I cover movies for a living, so I know when New York and L.A. are getting stuff. And sometimes we don't get some of the stuff they get for at least a month, which is, like, maddening. But, you know, that's not as extreme as what this is. I, I really don't know. Well, t- tell me this, Chris. You saw over 300 movies last year, correct? Yes. How many times did you actually step inside a movie theater? Oh God, I don't know. No, definitely not three hundred times. Um, yeah, but if you were going to estimate, was it, it like maybe fifty times? No, it's probably a little bit over a hundred times, but not. I can't imagine it being more than that. So, if you were able to see probably two hundred movies of the year without actually seeing them in theaters, how did you see them? Well, I also get like screeners yeah. for stuff because you know it's it's part of the job, so that's not really helpful. Um, so yeah, I, I become a film critic, sir, from Australia. There's your <laughs> there's your solution. Or I mean, I mean, a lot of the stuff like early, like what is the theatrical window now? Like, is it like a couple months at this point? A few months before like something leaves theaters and hits video? Like yeah, ninety days I it... maybe. I don't know. I think it is 90 days, yeah. I mean, I, I do understand the end of the year is tough because all the, everybody's talking about these Oscar movies and stuff like that. But I feel like by the end of the year, there's so many movies that are available either on streaming or on VOD that he could just watch at home. But maybe he would have to pay for them. I mean, you're still going to have to pay for them in the theater. So I don't know. Uh, does anybody else have any suggestions? I actually have a friend who's a, uh, a big movie fan who lived uh, in Adelaide, Australia, and they she would complain that they often wouldn't get movies until much later, too. But one of the ways that she rectified it is there's some film festivals uh, near her. I know Adelaide specifically has one. So maybe just if you can and you have the means, like try to he- head out and hit some of the film festivals because she was able to see some movies um, – that I had caught at Sundance that weren't yet getting theatrically released or had played other festivals. Um, and so you, you'll probably still have to wait a little while you then after their premiere at Sundance and, and whatnot. But that's probably a, a really good way to get some more movies under your belt. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, I remember when, when I was still living in Natick, Massachusetts, I would have to travel into Boston to the Landmark Theater in Boston to see anything that wasn't, you know, a big budget studio film. Like it, back then, 
that was the only way you could see independent fi- films unless, you know, obviously eventually them come out and be available at Blockbuster or Suncoast Video or something like that. So uh, things are a lot easier now. Um, but I used to also travel to film festivals. Like there was this yearly festival in Boston that I would go and I would basically travel in every day, even though it took like uh, not that long, probably like 30 minutes to an hour. And I would spend the the day in movie theaters in Boston watching films and that that's not a bad way to spend uh, a week. Um, okay, let's move on to next door uh, next question. This is from Derek from Buffalo, New York. He writes in uh, asking about movie theater concessions. He says, "When is the best time in a theater to eat your concessions? Do you eat your snacks during the previews, before some some during?" Uh, it seems like I always end up eating them all before the movie starts. I hope someday to shake the hand of some of the dads I see exiting the theater with candy remaining after the two and a half hour movie. So uh, I'm not sure. Like, for, for Actually, at first I thought this question was like, is it appropriate to be snacking on foods during a movie? But no. <laughs> no? Not at all? No. Chris hates hurt- snacking. Oh my God! Just stop. You can wait two hours, everyone. You don't need here's, to. Sit. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I I'm fine with snacking in movie theaters as long as you have already opened your snacks before the movie starts and you don't have a super loud wrapper that you're constantly crunching or reaching into. <laughs> yes. and, yes. and it's the noise. worst. That's and pop. And I don't know how popcorn became the, the official movie food, but it's uh, what a terrible idea. Just people crunching away. <laughs> You, you, like, I, I, yeah. Actually, actually, a question for you, Chris. It's a, you can blame the Great Depression. And popcorn was super cheap. Movies were the only affordable hobby for millions of Americans, and it took off. So yeah. blame Thanks American economy. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Herbert Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I'll answer the question. I'll answer this question directly, and that is, uh, you should eat some during the previews just to get the wrapper open, but save most for the movie itself because the whole point of the snack is to uh, uh, complement the movie. And during maybe some slower movies, you know, keep your energy up, give your hands something to do. And if you eat them all before the movie starts, you're a monster because why? Why even bother? <laughs> Usually it takes me the entire movie to watch, um, to eat my meal anyways or my snack because the popcorn bags, even the small versions, are huge. And I, it takes, I sometimes can't even finish them throughout the film. So I will start eating right away. And I love popcorn. So you can't stop me, Chris. I'll eat it all the time. <laughs> I mean, I don't dislike popcorn. It's, it's delicious. But people go, people go nuts. Yeah. Well, you would hate sitting next to me in a movie because one time I brought a whole Chipotle like burrito <laughs> bowl into a theater. Wait, wait what, what do we feel about there. that? Because number one, movie theaters don't make any of that money. Number two, people munching in like their smells. Like what if people bring like Chinese food or like, uh, like you know, I think, something. I think there's a limit to the food you eat. Like if you have to bring in food that requires a fork and a knife, like leave that out there. But if you're bringing in like, a sandwich or something like that because they sell sandwiches at the movie theater they have like burger sliders or chicken sandwiches and stuff like that but if you need some like something that requires a fork and a knife and you're not at an animal draft house or someplace that like <laughs> gives full meals then no like get, get the fuck out of here with that yeah <laughs> see I'm, I'm a nervous I, like when i get nervous i eat so like if you ever see me at a like a, a premiere of a star wars movie they give you like these buckets of popcorn that are like uh branded i guess they're from the el capitan theater and i'll usually grab one and before like the movie's not started i'm sitting in my seat and like 10 minutes go go by and like i've already eaten through all the popcorn because i'm just like sitting there nervously awaiting what's gonna come and i look over at my girlfriend kitra and she's like you should have waited um uh i i also think you know you mentioned opening snacks during the movie what's even worse is if you forget to open a snack before the movie starts is like when you try to open the snack and you're trying to be courteous so like you're i'm gonna open it slower so it makes like less noise but it it just like prolongs it does does that make sense like yeah yeah Yeah. it actually ends up making more noise because you're like I've done that before, too. Yeah. <laughs> and especially if it's during a very intense or quiet moment of a movie, and you just spend, like, five minutes trying to open this thing, and it's it still just, like, maintains that level of uh, of noise. Yeah, whenever... Much... Oh, go ahead. 
Sorry. I was just going to say, whenever I get uh, uh, snacks at the movie theater, it's almost always candy. And that's, you know, I probably do it like five times a year or something. But uh, every time I always try to, I get it in, you know, it comes in a box or something. And it's really loud whenever you're trying to like shake some out. So I'm always like staring at the screen, waiting for like an action heavy moment <laughs> to like, you know, shake my candy out <laughs> into my hand real quick. So I'm not like disturbing people during quiet parts of the movie. But uh, I don't know. I wish more people did that. But uh, I'm, one of the few like psychotic people to actually go that far and <laughs> try to preserve everybody else's experience. You, you know what's know, the know. worst is the quiet place. I had popcorn <laughs> in my hand during the quiet place and you couldn't there was like no opportunity, Ben. Like I I'm like you. I wait for more noisy moments to like munch on my popcorn because I, I'm trying to be courteous and there was like <laughs> no right time during that yeah. movie. I remember during uh speaking of the uh, Alma Draft House, which you know serves full meals and lots of food uh, two quick anecdotes I think are uh, that should be appreciated here. One, when you, when you get candy from them, we bring it out in a small takeout carton that you have to unlatch, you know, the little cardboard bit. So it actually makes no noise uh, when you open it at all. It's, and they, so it's no wrappers or anything. And they presumably buy it in bulk and, and, fill these, and fill these little containers, you know, backstage. So you, no wrapper noises whatsoever. Uh, secondly, when they showed a quiet place, I'm not sure if they did this for every screening, but during opening weekend, all the servers wore slippers and <laughs> and like so you couldn't even hear their footsteps as they as they moved around. You know the take orders, which are usually very good about being quiet about anyway and, and not disturbing you, but they were doubly careful just to make sure that they didn't disturb the experience. So it's but yeah, even then, like you could hear like like normally when you watch a movie, like if someone's eating a hamburger at the Elmo Draft House, I'd never hear it because you, unless you're a slob, you don't make a ton of noise when eating a hamburger. But even during a quiet place, you can hear like the occasional little munch, 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 munch. But it was, yeah, it's a very interesting experience uh, seeing a quiet place in a theater where you're kind of expected to have a meal with the movie. Yeah. And it's also weird when you're at the Elmo Draft House and you have something like a salad because then you got to kind of like look down and hit, hit it with a fork. Like I, I think Brad's right. If you need a fork, it's probably not good movie theater food in general because you just can't be looking down at your food during the movie. You want to be watching the movie. But macaroni and cheese. Draft House has good macaroni and cheese, Peter. What, what? <sighs> but I guess you could you could just put the fork into the macaroni and cheese and not have to look at it while you're doing it. I will stab the darkness and find my <laughs> macaroni and cheese. Yeah. And you accidentally stab uh, your wife's hand when you're <laughs> going down there. Uh, okay, let's move on to our last question. This is from Justin D. from Dallas, Texas. And he writes in, he's uh, happy to hear that we're having so much success with the keto diet. Uh, he's debating on di- on a diet going into next year. Again, this is one of those emails that we are very late into getting to. He says... Uh, uh, he was curious to know more about it. Uh, what is the meal planning like? Is it difficult diet? How much exercise is needed? And how does the diet make you feel? Um, I will start things off. I'll say uh, the diet, I feel like I have more energy. I feel more alert. I feel like I can concentrate on things better uh, in this diet, this is something that a, a lot of people say with the keto diet. What the keto diet is, is you're eating high fat, uh, like some protein, but low carbs, like under 20 grams a day. So that's basically a slice of bread. Um, and, uh, Jacob's also doing this diet. Uh, we, uh, I know Jacob <laughs> did not want to be that public about this because he hates, uh, you know, people telling him what he should and shouldn't be doing. Usually when you do the keto diet, you don't have to do any exercise. I'm not doing any exercise. I usually will go to uh, Chipotle for lunch and I'll walk my dogs to Chipotle. So my amount of exercise is really walking a mile to Chipotle. And Chipotle has uh, the bowls there you can get without rice and beans. And uh, basically you can get almost any of them and that would fit the keto diet. You can go to... Uh, you know, last night I went to a movie at Universal City Walk and I ate in their fast food um, food court. I ate at Smash Burger and found a Cobb salad there. So I could have had that. I could have had a burger without the bun. Uh, the, you can usually find something that's keto anywhere. Uh, you really just got to kind of look for the meat option. Don't, you know, have any potatoes or bread or basically, I, I think, like the big uh, rules to it. Um, but, uh, there are, you are more limited in your choices. Uh, Jacob, what have you found? Like, is it easy doing the keto diet? 
I found it to be remarkably easy because there are so many options. Like, for example, we recently discovered a bread called Sola Bread. I can't remember what it's made with, but it's only three carbs per slice of bread because it doesn't have traditional ingredients in it. Yeah. And it tastes, you know, like enough like bread. <laughs> and it's, um, it gets the job done uh, after your month into the diet. But, you know, there are so many companies making really good snacks for it. There are so many places where you can go in and say, you know, order a chicken breast and, and an appropriate side that you're I, – I, I mentioned in the podcast before, but this is the first diet I've been on in years where I don't feel miserable every day. I feel like I am okay. I feel like I'm living my mostly normal life. I mean, I do need to fill my snack time. Like, there, there are times where I'll be like, I'm going to sit down and eat a, a pizza and watch this uh, Netflix series. And now I have to – get used to not having, you know, the constant access to bad snacks, which is a good habit to make. But for the most part, like, I'm not having crazy constant cravings. I'm not grumpy. I'm not angry. The one thing I will mention is that a lot of people, myself included, about a week or so into the diet, get a thing called the keto flu, which is where your body is still adjusting to the uh, lower carb intake. And you get extremely tired. You feel sick. It lasts a few days. But then you're over it. And your energy, as Peter said, does go up. I feel... Really, really good, especially since I started uh, also do, doing a keto, keto powder. And there are many varieties out there. You've got to find the one you like, mixing with a little bit of black coffee, and it just, you know, it keeps my energy up, and I feel really good. Um, as, as someone who's done a lot of low-carb diets over the years, this is the one thing my, my body responds to. I have all kinds of uh, issues that make other diets not really work for me. This is the only one I've had where I have not woke up every morning wanting to kill myself. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I said there, there are so many resources. Um, my wife pointed me toward keto Instagram, where if you just follow the people who do keto, there's so many recommendations for yeah. recipes, for food, for products, for choices. Like even we found people in, in our in our city who do keto and they're always sharing restaurant recommendations where they go to restaurants and say, here's something that's keto friendly. And we add to our list. So like I said it's, it's definitely something that when I set out to do a diet. That's going to last me for the next 18 months minimum with only a handful of cheat days until I hopefully reach my goal weight. I was really nervous, but, you know, I'm over a month into this now. and I genuinely feel like, hey, uh, I don't feel like this is going to be a failure this time. Yeah, there, there's this great channel called Keto Connect. It's this uh, husband and wife and they do like daily videos and they have lots of recipes and stuff. I think with any diet, but in keto in particular, you need to set yourself up for success you need to have a lot of options to eat like jacob and i every week on the water cooler are talking about these cool keto snacks and stuff you need to like kind of stock up your fridge with options not just those kind of things but like you know i have bacon and eggs and i have some steak in the freezer and i have do you know what i mean like you need to have the stuff there and you need to make it uh, available to you or else you're going to fail. And before you go to a restaurant, you need to look at the menu and, you know, make some decisions. It requires some pre-planning, but it's not hard. I mean, obviously keto is not the only way you could lose weight. Many people lose weight with traditional diet. Hold on. I would like to say that if you're not into the keto diet thing, you can just go and uh, get whatever you want to at the store or a restaurant or whatever. And it makes things way easier. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that's one way you can lose weight i don't know it, it, it's, it's i actually i actually have a question about the, the keto diet because okay. i've read this uh isn't it true that like if the minute not the minute but if you go off it even a little like you gain almost everything back like that was the only reason i never wanted to try it because i've read that in several places that like it, this, as soon as you're off it you gain everything back like almost like right away. And that's... yeah, I've heard the same thing too, that if, if you go off the keto diet, like if, if you've decided you're done with it and you're at your goal weight, like you suddenly gain a lot of weight back really easily. Which, yeah, which stuff like that worries me, which is why I like, I thought about trying it once, but I, I read that several places and I said, all right, I don't want to risk that. Well, In my experience, the diet, the weight you immediately gain after going on a cheat meal or, or going off a diet tends to f come off easier than if you let it sit there on your body for like months, months, months. So yeah, I think after any diet, you'll you'll gain a sudden burst of weight when you leave it, but then you but you have to go back on the diet and it'll, it'll pretty much fall right off, in, in my experience. So yeah, as a person who's struggled with my weight my entire life, this is going to be my new, this is my new reality. When I reach my goal of weight, maybe I'll have like, you know, a cheat day once a week to keep myself, you know, um, let myself have that. 
but um, there's never going to be a point in my life where I am just going to let myself go. It, it can't be because no matter what I do, I will gain weight back. My metabolism is not built for me to keep it off. So this is my new re- this is this is my new go to. This is my new normal. And when I, when I hopefully reach my goal weight, you know, I'm looking at 18 months is, is my is my goal. Um, you know, I'll I'll start looking into you know once a week, letting myself you know have some fun. But until then, I, this is a diet meant to be a lifestyle, not meant to be a temporary thing to lose the weight and just be done with it. It's 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 something you have to fundamentally change your life around. My my plan in the long term is once I hit my goal weight to maybe not be on keto, but I'm still going to be low carb, low sugar. Because one thing this diet is teaching me is how much sugar is in everything that we eat, and you know, avoiding that one thing can, you know. I think most doctors would agree is is good for your body, but I don't know. It's tough. I I, I think you know. I like a few years back, I gained, I, I lost a lot of weight, um, basically just on a low calorie diet, and then I went on a cruise and gained like twenty pounds back. So I mean, I think that that can happen with any diet, but uh, I don't know. Your mileage may vary. I know uh, I, I, I'm very happy with my success so far. I'm at like 42 pounds. Uh, Jacob's not doing the pounds, but he, if you look at his Instagram, he's fitting into shirts he you know, couldn't fit into before. I have friends that uh, have been inspired by this, uh, inspired by me, which is, is, is amazing. Uh, one of my friends just texted me today and said he has lost 10 pounds in the, uh, you know, just a few weeks. Uh, so that's incredible. And I'm not, like, again, I don't want to be, I know we're going along with the podcast. I don't want to be the keto podcast and it's you evangelista <laughs> keto, but, uh, out of it's working, it's working for me and Jacob. And I think, uh, whatever works for you is good for you, but I think you just got to stick to it. Like you just got to set your mind to it and, you know, not cheat, you know, g- give yourself rules and limitations. Rules and limitations are, I think, what makes a diet work. And, uh, you know, you got to have rules for cheat days like I talked about on the latest water cooler. Um, and I, I think once you get that, you know, it can be anything. It can be Weight Watchers. It can be Slim Fest. It could be, you know, a, a normal diet. It could be, uh, you know keto it could be what paleo uh whole food 30 whatever you want um but it is interesting that a lot of the diets now like paleo and whole food 30 are kind of going in the same direction as keto diet and like keto uh the keto diet is kind of taking off in a way you're seeing like products in major stores like walmart and target and uh there's a keto restaurant that's going to be opening in my town um so or city rather um so uh, it does seem like it is something picking up steam and isn't just like, you know, the latest fad. But uh, but yeah, it's anybody else have anything else to say about dieting as we're giving dieting advice to uh, this reader, Justin D. Nope. <laughs> nope. OK. Watch uh, more movies. Enjoy movies while you're dieting. As this is a movie podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh, one other thing is I used to drink a lot of diet soda. And diet soda doesn't have any calories. It doesn't have any sugar. Um, but it does have artificial sweeteners. And I've, you know, even more recently been trying to cut back on diet soda. Um, the diet soda I do drink is Zevia, which has Stevia as a sweetener. And that does not affect your blood sugar sugar level. And that helps with keto, whatever. But, um, you know, I went to the movie theaters yesterday to see How to Train Your Dragon two or three, and uh, I just got a cup of water. Um, and drinking water makes me feel more healthy than I, I used to hate it because I feel like I need something that has flavor in my drink. But um, I'm getting more used to drinking water. Jacob, are you finding that? Uh, yeah, I drink a lot of water each day, and just not even intentionally, I've cut down on my diet soda a lot. I still love soda a great deal and when i have my first weekend off in um april i'll probably indulge a little bit in soda but i'm not feeling requirement to drink it every day like i used to well cool that brings us to the end of today's slash film daily you can find more of all of us at slash film.com you can find this podcast on uh itunes google play overcast spotify all the popular podcast apps please feel free to send us your feedback questions comments concerns 
to peter at slashfilm.com and leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention the email on the air. And please go to our iTunes page. Give us a five-star rating and review. Tell your friends. Spread the word. And we will see you on Monday.